Greetings everyone, welcome to today's lecture on Indian Sculptures, A Rhythmic Journey Through Time and Space. Indian sculptors had mastered the bronze medium as well as the casting process. So much so that terracotta sculpture was not the only kind of sculptural art that was developing. The siriperdo or lost wax process for casting had been learnt as early as the Indus Valley culture. Along with it was discovered the process of making alloy of metals by mixing different metals like copper, zinc and tin which came to be called bronze. So bronze sculptures and statues of Buddhist, Jain and uh, Hindu icons have been discovered from different regions of India dating from the 2nd century until the 16th century. Most of these were used for ritual worship and were characterized by exquisite and beautiful aesthetic appeal. The metal casting process continued to be utilized for making articles for different purposes of daily use, for example, utensils for cooking, eating, drinking, etc. The dancing girl from Mohanjadaro is the earliest bronze sculpture datable to 2500 BCE. A similar group of bronze statues have been discovered from archaeological excavation at Daimabad in Maharashtra datable to around 1500 BCE. Significant is the chariot, the wheels of which are represented in simple circular shapes while the driver or the human rider has been elongated and the bulls in the forefront are modelled in sturdy forms. So, we see that when we are talking about metal sculptures, it is not that we should only focus on Cholas or for that matter the, the preceding dynasty of Pallavas because we have a whole lot of tradition of bronze making uh, and also sculptures uh, using different metals and as you can see in this image, the one that I had just explained, that of a chariot belonging to around 1500 BCE and found in Daimabad. Here you can see such minute details that the rider is shown in a standing position and the bulls are shown as if they are surging forward. Then some very interesting images of Jain Tirthankaras have been discovered from Chausa, Bihar belonging to Kushana period during 2nd uh, century CE. These bronzes show how the Indian sculptors had mastered the modeling of masculine human physique as well as simplified muscles. So it was not only the stone which was a very important medium uh, during the Mathura and Gandhara art but metal also was kind of being experimented with. The depiction of Adinath or Vrishabhnath who is identified with long hair locks dropping to his shoulders. The Tirthankars are noted by their short curly hair. Gujarat and Rajasthan have been strongholds of Jainism since early times and a series of such images have also been found in these regions. A famous hoard of Jain bronzes was found at Akota on the outskirts of Baroda dated between the end of the 5th and the end of the 7th century CE. As you can see this visual of Akota bronzes where different kinds and images uh, which have been categorized as being belonging to Akota bronzes. Now this is a visual of Akota Jain bronze. So clearly you can see the kind of expression which is there and uh, also the posture, the sitting posture as well as the carving on the throne 
the seat on which this Tirthankar is seated is quite distinct and different from the other kind of sculptures that were being made during this period. Now, bronzes were often subsequently inlaid with silver and copper to bring out or, or to highlight the eyes, crowns and detailing of the textiles or also to highlight uh, the seat on which the figure was seated. So, many famous Jain bronzes from Chausa in Bihar which are now kept in Patna Museum uh, are definitely uh, worth uh, watching and all these features are clearly visible in them. Many Jain bronzes from Hansi in Haryana and from different sites in Tamil Nadu and Karnataka are kept in various museums in India and definitely they have a story to narrate. The hoard of bronzes discovered in Akota near Vadodara established that bronze casting was practiced in Gujarat or Western India between the 6th and 9th centuries. So, therefore, we cannot really uh, neglect uh, this period and these regions and we cannot only talk about uh, Chola uh, sculptures when one is talking about metal iconography. Most of the images represent the Jain Tirthankaras like Mahavira, Parsavnath or Adinath. Tirthankaras are usually seated on a throne. They can be single or combined in a group of 3 or in a group of 24 Tirthankaras. Uh, then female images were also cast representing Yakshinis uh, and also as Shasana Devis of some prominent Tirthankaras. Stylistically, they were influenced by the features of both the Gupta as well as the Vakataka period bronzes. So, Chakreshwari was the Shashana Devi of Adinath and Ambika was that of Neminath. Uh, besides this, many standing Buddha images with right hand in Abhay Mudra were cast in North India especially uh, in UP and Bihar during the Gupta as well as post Gupta periods that is roughly between 5th to 7th centuries. Uh, so, there were major developments as far as metal iconography is concerned even in North India in addition to Western India as well as uh, South India later on. So, the Sanghati or the monk's robe was wrapped to cover the shoulders which turned over the right arm. In the typical bronze from Dhanesar Khera uh, which, which is in UP, the folds of the drapery are treated as in the Mathura style that is in a series of drooping down curves. Uh, then Sarnath style bronzes however had foldless drapery. So, here again we see considerable uh, difference and regional diversity as far as even bronze statues were concerned. The Buddha image at Sultan Ganj in Bihar uh, which is quite a monumental bronze figure and this kind of depicted a typical refined style and this was also indicative of the classical quality that was emerging. Uh, here in this visual that is being shared with you on the screen, you can see the impressive image of Sultan Ganj Buddha, where it is uh, quite different from the traditional kind of depiction of Buddha in a meditative mode, whether it is Gandhara art or Mathura art. So, here we see a different kind of a depiction. Then uh, this is another visual which shows Dhanesar Khera Buddha dated 5th CE. Here again, there is lot of detailing that, that went with the use of metal, but at the same time, there had to be simplicity as compared to the carvings that could be done on stone. 
The additional importance of the Gupta and Vakataka bronzes is that they were portable and monks carried them from one place to another for the purpose of individual worship or they could also be installed in some Buddhist viharas as many uh, metal images have been uh, found in several Buddhist viharas. So, this kind of uh, idea was definitely very popular of carrying metal images as they were smaller in size, they were portable and then they could be uh, kept wherever they had to be worshipped. In this manner, the refined classical style spread to different parts of India as well as outside India in several uh, Asian countries. And so we see that with the use of metal, this kind of mobility uh, 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 definitely got a boost. Now coming to uh, our discussion on the Pallava and Chola bronzes. Uh, though the Pallavas and Cholas were prolific builders of temples and generous patrons of arts, their art is identified with the magnificent bronze sculpture. So, the great pieces of art and workmanship that were made, what was their purpose? One purpose was definitely for taking them out during processions on specific festive days and also to be kept in temples. However, some were also made for private worship. Probably they were commissioned by royalty or by the elites and derived from earlier clay images. This form, while it was considered to be a folk art, it incorporated later on several aspects of classical art. A very important technique that one must be clear about when one is talking about metal sculpture is the lost wax technique. These bronzes were cast in the Sire Perdu or lost wax process. The process can be described simply in a way that the image is first made in wax. It is then given several coats of fine clay and then dried in the shade. Then two holes are made on the top and the bottom and uh, the next stage is that the whole structure is heated so that the wax can melt away leaving behind a hollow mold into which then molten metal is poured. So there was, uh, there were multiple stages as far as lost wax technique was concerned. The clay mold is then broken off after the metal has solidified and final dressing is done by hand probably with a chisel and some abrasive material. So this was how the lost wax technique had evolved and this is how it came to be utilized by Pallava and Chol sculptors. The rule of the Pallavas and Cholas between 7th to 13th centuries definitely indicated a high point of bronze sculptural art form. Pallava art form manifested itself around 7th century and uh, probably it had lot of influence from Amravati school of art. So, what we see is that while Gandhara and Mathura art were influencing sculptural traditions in northern India and also in western India, uh, here uh, in southern India, it was Amravati school of art which was quite influential. While there was a foreign influence in the form of Yavana or Roman influences and the presence of Roman artifacts, the bronzes are believed to be largely an indigenous art form and the patronage of these art objects usually came from Pallava rulers like Mahendra Varman and several others. So, if we talk about Pallava bronzes, they definitely have a resemblance to the lithic sculpture also of the period. The development of Pallava bronzes 
can be divided into different phases. The main phases that one can talk about are the four distinct phases. So, the first phase was the phase up to the 7th century CE, which is also known as Mahendra phase, named after the ruler Mahendra Varman. So, very important developments took place during this first phase. Then we, coming, uh, we come to the second phase, uh, which can roughly be ascribed to the first half of 8th century. And this uh, phase is known as Rajasimha phase, named after the builder of Mamalapuram and Kanchi. So, uh, the period from 700 to 730 was very important. Then coming to the third phase or the second half of 8th century, so roughly ranging between 750 to 800 CE, this phase was named after Nandi Varman II. And then the fourth phase from 795 to 845 CE, which was named after Danti Varman. Now, all these four phases, there were very important developments that took place. The later half of the 9th century, however, marks the transition towards the Chola type of bronzes. And Raja Raja Chola had established himself around 850 CE. Now, if we talk about Pallava bronze sculptures, most of their sculptures indicate that they were Shaivites and dedicated various forms of Shiva in the temple complex. The bronze sculptures built by the early Pallavas were much smaller in size as compared to those that were built during the later phases. Then Pallavas definitely developed Shaivite iconography. However, it is not as if uh, they did not worship Vishnu because several images of Vishnu uh, have also been unearthed. They utilized their remarkable wealth that they had earned through their wide-ranging conquests in building long-lasting stone temples and also some wonderful bronze sculptures. Most of the bronze sculptures were less than one foot high and uh, the figures were natural in pose and molding. So, uh, they began uh, by making smaller images. The faces of these bronze sculptures were slightly taller and broad with a flat nose and double chin. Now, this was also a distinctive character of Pallava bronzes. The front of the torso of these sculptures was almost flat and the emblems were as a rule either held naturally in the hand or they were placed just above them. So, here again we see that many changes were going to come by the time Chola sculpture would start. So, in this visual, you can see all the features that I have just described. This is an example of Pallava bronze sculpture, where you can see the emblem definitely in the hand and a shorter image. The kirita or the headdress of these bronze sculptures was usually cylindrical and the har or the necklace was rather simple in shape. And uh, there is also no trace of the metal images of the early phase of the Pallava period as at that time rituals were very simple. So, as the rituals became more complex, as religion was evolving and as there were changes that were coming about, uh, we see that a far more number of metal images were being made. And after the 8th century, the bronze started appearing from time to time. The bronze sculptures of the Pallavas have rounded and chubby face with distinct features like a fleshy nose and almond-like eyes, naturalistic eyebrows and very tender lips also with a smile. Now, if we talk about some prominent bronze sculptures of Pallavas, then uh, some of these can be uh, described as the 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 idol of Vishnu as Srinivas and 
from Peruno Totem uh, and also uh, this bronze sculpture of Vishnu is said to be the earliest of the bronzes of the Pallava period. So, four hands, the upper left hand carrying a conch or a shank and the right hand carrying the chakra or the discus while the lower right in the abhay uh, mudra uh, and the left resting on the hip. So, all these uh, features you can see in this image that is being shown to you uh, is, which is that of Sri Nivas Vishnu. Again, you see a very different kind of image being made. He is represented with two spouses, one being Sri Devi or the goddess of prosperity identified as goddess Lakshmi and the other is Bhu Devi or the earth goddess. Now both these goddesses were shown standing on the right and left sides of Vishnu each having a pair of arms while one carried the flower the other hanged freely. The Devis were shown wearing the prominent elbow ornaments of like the simple conch and stripped lower garment. The discus of Srinivas, the girdle of Srinivas, then the padmas of the deities, all these were rendered very naturalistically. And the characteristic modeling of Srinivas with a majestic torso uh, and also with proportionate legs and slender rendering of the devis uh, identify these sculptures as belonging to the Pallava period. As you can see in this visual, how the Devis are shown in a slender and in a more rhythmic form, whereas the central deity is standing erect. So, having discussed all these features, uh, we can definitely say that Indian sculpture was evolving as time was passing. Thank you.